Scope and hello Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here. Let me get this particular recording going. There we go. PDT here, uh, here for your weekly uh, live prophetic word. Uh, thanks to all of you that are joining me live. Yeah, I appreciate it. God bless you. I am on at this time every Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I am on the second Thursday of every month with my series called No More Genies, where we talk about getting rid of our genie concept of God and getting into the, what, what the word actually says. Okay? So let's dive in to the prophetic word for today. So we always start out with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day, O oh God. Thank you for the worship this morning, O oh God. Thank you for being able to walk into your presence by grace. Um, we have access uh, into your presence by grace, and we have peace with you because of Jesus. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Thank you, O oh God, for all the privileges that come along with being born again. Oh God, all the things you do for us that are just unspeakable. We can't even describe them with words. We can't even make other people understand the kind of blessings you bestow upon us because of your goodness. And thank you for teaching us how to be faithful and how to show up and how to be diligent and how to be faithful to you like you have always been faithful to us. Uh, because you are definitely a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. So I just ask you to be in the midst of this broadcast. I surrender to the Holy Ghost. I surrender my mind, my brain, my thoughts, my word, my tongue, my hands, my gestures, everything. I surrender to the filling of the Holy Ghost, O oh God. So speak through me and let what you want to be said to be said, O oh God, so that you might manifest in this broadcast, that you might get the glory in all things, and that the you know, kingdom of the enemy might be torn down again today, in the name of Jesus, and that sinners would be challenged to believe in you and to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and to enter into the kingdom of God and enter into life. I thank you for it, I believe you for it, and I count it as an honor and a privilege to be called to serve you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen and amen. Well, again, God bless you. Thank you for everybody that's joining me live. We're going to jump right in. I told you my regular times that I'm on. Uh, I strongly encourage you to watch my No More Genies series on second Thursday nights because we've been talking about some deep things and uh, some edifying things. And it really helps to break if you have what I call bad church habits or bad church teaching. If you've been involved in, in doctrine that is just not sound and you've been doing some things your whole life and they're just not biblical, then you really need to take a walk back through certain scriptures and re-examine them in the light of what they're actually saying and get rid of a genie concept of God and get a biblical concept of God so we can serve him the way he wants us to and so he can bless us the way he wants to, okay? Today, our prophetic word for today is faith for miracles. Faith for miracles. That's the prophetic word for today. And we're going to look at a couple of scriptures to back that up. Okay? And uh, I'm going to read the scriptures and I'm going to go back and show you what, uh, what, what I believe the Lord wants you to see in the scriptures. So first we're going to look at 1 Kings 17.1. 1 Kings 17.1. 1 Kings is in the Old Testament. Okay, First Kings in the Old Testament, there's uh, six books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, that are all talking about basically the same time period, but they kind of take it from different angles. So Samuel talks about it from more from when Samuel, Samuel was the last official prophet, while the nation of Israel was still, was still under the leadership of the prophets, but they asked God to be under a monarchy which is one of the worst mistakes they ever made. They asked God for a monarchy because other nations had it. And God told them, you don't need a king because you have me. But they insisted. So God let them have their way. And Israel switched over to a monarchy, which was a huge, huge mistake. And they never recovered from that. But uh, First and Second Kings talks about the reign of these kings and how they behaved and how they impacted the nation. Okay. So we're going to look at 1 Kings 17.1. This is also the first appearance of Elijah, Elijah the Old Testament prophet. This is the first time we see him in the Bible. 
Okay, and I'm going to show you why that's significant in a minute. So 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, and I'm reading out of the King James. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, Ahab was the king of Israel at the time, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Okay, let me read that to you in the New Living Translation. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Okay? So, that's scripture number one. Uh, we're going to move now to Acts chapter three. <clears throat> now, Acts chapter three uh, is a very familiar passage of scripture. This is uh, where Peter and John heal a lame man. So we're going to read verses 1 through 10. Acts is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Okay, in the New Testament, we're going to read from chapter 3. Now, the reason it's called Acts is because it's basically the birth of the early church. It's the Acts of the Apostles. It's what they did after Jesus ascended and went back into heaven. So Jesus' life is chronicled in what we call the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So then we would naturally want to know, well, what happened after that? After Jesus went back up to heaven, what happened? That's what the book of Acts is about, the birth of the first church, the early church, the day of Pentecost, and what they did after Jesus went back to heaven. That's why it's called Acts, okay? So we're going to read Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, and I'm reading out of the NIV or the New International Version. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. That's the name of the gate where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Okay? Now we're going to look at one more scripture. We're going to look at John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 42. Now remember, this is written by John the Apostle, the one that laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. That, that's the man that wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. That's all the same man. It's not all the same time period where he wrote it, but that's all the same guy. We're going to look at John chapter 11, verse 42. Now in John chapter 11, this is where Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead. Okay, if you're familiar with that story, Jesus was friends with a family, or if you're not familiar, Jesus was friends with a family that consisted of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and a brother named Lazarus. And when the Lord was in town, he would stay at their house and eat food with them. Well, one day they came and told Jesus that Lazarus was sick and he was about to die. The Lord let him die and then went to their house and raised him from the, from the dead, even though he'd been in the grave for four days already. Okay. So I want you, second time hearing that today, so I want you to notice what the Lord says here in John eleven forty two. He says, I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible. I knew that you always hear me. Well, let's look at verse 41 so you get some context. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted his eyes upward and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, so they may believe that you sent me. 
After Jesus had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, or Lazarus, come forth. Okay? So today's prophetic word is called Faith for Miracles. So now we're going to go back and I'm going to tell you what I want you to see in those scriptures. The first thing I want you to see going back to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, is that Elijah in that verse did not pray. Now maybe he had already gotten a word from the Lord, but he didn't pray. And he didn't say, if it be thy will. That's not what Elijah said. Elijah said to Ahab, uh, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, is not going to reign in the next few years except when I say so. Elijah came on the scene. The first thing he did when he came on the scene was he said, I'm going to shut up the heavens and ain't going to be no rain for the next few years until I give the word. Elijah did not pray. He spoke. He declared. He told Ahab, Ahab this is how this is going to be. This is how this is going to go. And he said it was an open-ended prophetic word, meaning that it wasn't going to rain until Elijah said so. So Elijah didn't say, for the next two years it's not going to rain, which would have meant exactly two years from that date it would rain again. That's not what he said. He said, for the next few years, there's not going to be dew nor rain. That means no moisture whatsoever in the next few years, except at my word or until I give the word. So Elijah said, I'm shutting up the heavens and I'm cutting off the moisture on the earth. There's no dew. There's no rain for the next few years. And that's an indefinite term. He didn't say two years or one year, three years. He said for the next few years until I say so. Elijah didn't pray and ask God, say, if it's your will. He declared, he said, this is how this is going to be until I say different. Wow. He said, I'm shutting up the heavens and I'm cutting off the moisture from the earth. Wow. Okay. Why is that important? Because if you grew up and you have, you know, certain religious backgrounds, you might have heard people say, Oh, Lord, we come to you, Jesus, and we want you to do this if it be thy holy will. That ain't what Elijah said. Elijah said, this is what's happening. Okay? Let's examine Acts. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. When the man uh, saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. So both Peter and John turned their attention and looked at this man that had been lame all this time. Then Peter said, look at us. Peter said, look at us. Meaning, look at me, me and John. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, those famous words, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then Peter took him by the hand and pulled him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. I want you to notice that Peter didn't pray. <laughs> Peter didn't pray and ask the Lord and say, if it be thy will for me to heal this man. Did you notice that? The man said, do y'all have any money? I need some cash. I need some coins. I need some change. Peter said, look at us, me and John. So the man turned and looked fully at him. He said, I'll have silver and gold, but what I do have, I'm going to give you that. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk or rise up and walk. And then Peter grabbed him and pulled him up. Nowhere in there did Peter pray and say, if it be thy will. Okay, now we're going to look at John 11. Uh, John 11, verses 41, 42, and 43. I just read them to you. The Lord said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But then he said, I know that you always hear me. I know that you always hear me. I know that you always hear me. Uh, but I said it for the benefit of the people standing around. And then Jesus, after the Lord said that, he said in a loud voice, loud voice Lazarus, come forth. He didn't say, Father, if it be thy will. <laughs> he said, I already know you heard me. Then he called Lazarus forth, and Lazarus came Lazarus came in those grave clothes, jumping and hopping out the grave. And the Lord said, loose him and let him go. So what am I trying to get you to see? I'm trying to get you to see that if you need a miracle from God, you can't be in the land of if. So many people are praying to God, if it be thy will. And if it's in the scripture, you don't have to ask God if it's your will. Okay. If you get a rhema word or a prophetic word from God, 
where God says, I'm releasing this to you. Then you don't have to say, if it be thy will, because these men here that did these miracles, they didn't say, again, Elijah and Peter didn't even pray. They just said, Elijah said, I'm finna shut up the heavens and ain't gonna be no doing on the ground for the next few years. Elijah said, I'm proclaiming a drought over the nation. That's like if somebody got online and tweeted and said, ain't going to be no rain or dew in America before 2021 or until I say so. That's what Elijah did. Okay. And then Peter and John, they didn't pray. He didn't say, Lord, if it be your will for me to heal this man. He said, I have. He said, such as I have. That means that Peter knew he had the anointed healing power of God in him, and he didn't have to ask the Lord, is it your will for me to use it? Is it your will for me to have it? It was in him. Is it your will for me to use it? He didn't pray. He, look, he told the man, look at us. He said, such as I have, I have the anointed healing power of Jesus Christ in me, and so in his name, get up and walk. And then Peter did not ask the man, can I pull you up? Peter just grabbed him and pulled him up. And after Peter grabbed him and pulled him up, the Bible says, then his ankles immediately received strength and the man stood up and started leaping and praising God. Okay? So principle number one, I'm trying to get you about having faith for miracles, is that, and, and when Jesus prayed, he said, I know that you always hear me. You can't be in the land of if. You've got to go to a new level of confidence, boldness, and faith if you want to have faith for miracles because these men didn't, Elijah and Peter didn't even pray. They just said, this is how this is going to go. Peter said, this is what I have. I have this in me and I'm going to give it to you. Not if it be thy will. Whoa, Father, we come to you humble as we know how. In the name of Jesus, how? If it be thy holy will. How? That ain't what he did. He said, look at us. I got the healing power. And then he, he did not ask the man, is it okay if I pull you up? He just grabbed him. And some of y'all looking at me are looking at God for miracles. So principle number one, you got to get out of the land of if. You got to know. You got to know. Okay? So principle one, number one, you got to get out of the land of if. And you got to get into the land of no. I know this is what the Lord wants for me. I know this is what the scriptures say. I know this is the will of God. Okay, so principle number one, get out the land of if, get into the land of no. That's number one. Principle number two, you got to say it. Elijah said there's not going to be any rain for the next few years until I give the word. Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Okay, so principle number two is you got to say it. So if you are trying to get a miracle out of God, you got to speak it. You got to say it. Okay, and you know, so when I was growing up, people used to do this thing called a silent request. We would be standing around in the prayer line and they, they would raise their hand and say, I have a silent prayer. I have a silent request. I stopped by to tell you, ain't no such thing as a silent miracle. That ain't nowhere in the Bible. I challenge you to find me that. I challenge you to find me anywhere in the Bible where before a miracle happened, did nobody say nothing. <laughs> Every time there's a miracle in the Bible, when food is multiplied, when the water is parted, when manna comes down from heaven, when Lazarus is raised from the dead, when that little girl that died, Jesus raised that little girl from the dead, when Peter walked on the water. Every time there's a miracle in the Bible, somebody said it. Ain't no silent miracles nowhere in the scripture. The Bible says when the woman with the issue of blood was healed, the woman that reached out and, and touched the uh, hem of Jesus' garment and her issue of blood was healed because that woman had spent all the money she had and gone to all the doctors, she knew and she still didn't get no healing. The Bible says she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And the verb tense there on she said meant it was continual, meaning she didn't just say it one time. She continually said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. Watch this. I'm going to touch him. I bet you when I touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and I'm going to be whole. She kept saying it. She said, okay, because ain't no silent miracles anywhere. I challenge you to find me anytime a miracle was done, but did nobody say nothing. 
Okay? So principle number one, you've got to come out to a land of if and you've got to know. Principle number two, you've got to say it and you've got to keep saying it. you got to declare it. Okay? My pastor uh, has us do that all the time. My pastor tells us uh, to, when you get a revelation from the Spirit, he says, prophesy to yourself. He says, say it, declare it. And then many times he leads us in prophetic declarations and he has us repeat after him. Because you got to say it. If you want this thing to manifest in your life, you got to say it. Okay? That's number two. But number three, here come number three. Number three, uh, Peter did it and Jesus did it. You got to put some works behind your faith. Now, Elijah did it by having the nerve to get in Ahab's face and declare it. Okay, but what Peter did was he grabbed that man. He grabbed that man that had been crippled all his life, and he did not ask him, is it okay if I grab you? Because, you know, nowadays people will go crazy. And, oh, lawsuit. Ah, but in the Bible, Peter was like, he grabbed him, and he pulled him up. And then, then, so what does that mean? And then when Jesus rolled the stone away, rolled the stone away, rolled the stone away, Roll the stone away. Why would you roll the stone away from the front of a grave? It's because you expect somebody to get up. Isn't that the craziest thing you've ever seen and thought about? Have you ever thought about that scene, how Jesus told him to roll the stone away before he ever spoke the words? Why did the Lord say roll the stone away? Because he expected Lazarus to get up before he ever said anything. Okay. So what's my point? My point is that principle number three is you've got to put some works behind that declaration of faith. If you are expecting a physical miracle, like let's say you're having trouble walking and you are speaking the word and every day you got to be getting up. I'm getting up. You got to be trying to get be sitting in your bed, feeling sorry for yourself, saying one day. That ain't what Peter did. Peter grabbed him and pulled him up. Okay, the Lord told them to roll the stone away. Why would you ever open a grave? Have you ever seen a, a corpse exhumed? Because sometimes legally they have to exhume a corpse for evidence. And you might have seen that like on CSI or something where they, they get a dead body out the ground so they can gather new evidence. Well, when they open the tomb, they expect to find a corpse in there. Jesus, and there is a corpse in there. Well, Jesus said, roll the stone away because a live body was coming out. Can you imagine how crazy that looked until Lazarus came hopping out? Remember that, if you're familiar with the story, Lazarus' sister said to the Lord, he'd been dead four days. His body started to decompose. He's stinking by now. And the Lord still said, roll the stone away. So principle number one, you've got to get out the land of if, and you've got to know God's will through the scripture or through a prophetic word. Number two, you got to say it because ain't no silent miracles. Number three, you got to put some works behind your faith. You got to act like what you're saying is going to manifest because all this stuff, Elijah made a declaration for the next couple of years. What Peter and John did happened instantly. What the Lord said happened instantly. Okay, so you got to put some uh, works behind that faith number three and here come principle number four and this is probably the one that stops most people you got to be willing to look crazy i know you don't like that one you got to be willing to look crazy how crazy does elijah look coming up to the king of the country talking about it ain't gonna rain till i say so okay how crazy do peter and john look say we don't have no money but you're gonna get up i know you've been lame ever since you were born you're gonna walk today and then Peter just grabbed him. How crazy does that look? See, in our, when I say I'm in America, in American culture, uh, you might get sued for assault. <laughs> if you just went up to somebody in a wheelchair and you just grabbed him, <laughs> it's not funny. You might get sued for assault in our culture. And Peter just grabbed him. He did not ask permission. Because Peter expected him to get up because Peter knew he had the healing power of God in him. So they was willing to look crazy. And number four of you, Jesus, how crazy you got to look to say, this body been in that tomb for the better part of a week and it started to decompose and Jesus said, roll the stone away because Lazarus coming up out of there. So number one, got to get out of get out of the land of if, you got to know. Number two, you got to say it, ain't no silent miracles. Number three, you got to put some works behind your faith and number four, you got to be willing to look crazy. 
How crazy did the woman with the issue of blood look to get that healing from Jesus? Because she had to approach Jesus from behind. Now, you have to understand that in the Jewish culture of the time, as a woman, she had no right to touch the rabbi. And the Bible says that there was a crowd of people around Jesus. They were thronging him. That means it's like when the paparazzi go after a celebrity. There was all kinds of people all around Jesus. And that woman had to fight her way through that crowd. And she had to reach out and she had to touch the bottom of his robe. And the Lord turned around and said, who touched me? And his friends was like, what you mean who touched you? All these people. And the Lord said, no, I felt virtue grow out of me. She literally, because the Lord was not looking at her. The Lord was facing somewhere else and the Lord turned around and said, who touched me? That means Jesus wasn't looking at her. That means that woman pulled that virtue out of Jesus without him looking at her because she believed. That means she had to be reaching through a whole bunch of people and grab his clothes. And when she touched him in his garment, the virtue, the healing power flowed out of Jesus into her body. And all of a sudden she felt herself get home. And as a woman, she wasn't supposed to touch the rabbi like that. Especially as an unclean woman, she wasn't supposed to touch a rabbi like that. So that woman was taking a real chance. And I want you to imagine her pressing her way through a crowd of people. Because have you ever seen paparazzi swarm a celebrity? That's the way they were swarming Jesus. Can you imagine being in a crowd like that? Let's say somebody famous is walking down the street and the paparazzi just all on him. And the people and their fans, ah, and they screaming. And she had to press her way through all that. And not only did she have to press her way, that means she had to get up close to the Lord if she had to grab his clothes. That means she had to fight through all the people. And she's sick with her issue of blood. She had to fight through all the people, reach out to all that crowd, and grab his clothes. And she literally pulled the healing out of Jesus because the Lord was not facing her. Because the Bible said he turned around and said, who touched me? How crazy did that woman with the issue of blood look? to do that. So that's the fourth principle. You've got to be willing to look crazy. That's why a lot of people don't get their miracles. Because you go look crazy. You're just going to look crazy until it comes to pass. Okay? You go look crazy until it comes to pass, but that's what it takes to get your miracle. That's what it takes. Them four principles that I gave you according to the scriptures that we studied today. So, what the Spirit of God wants to let me let you know is to tell the people of God to start walking in this level of faith. Start practicing these principles. Now, let me hasten to say, and what I'm about to say is not contradictory, but let me hasten to say that if it don't work the first time, like you see it in the Bible, the thing to do is to not give up. You need to understand that faith works like muscles. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you go to the gym and you haven't been to the gym in a long time, you can't automatically bench press or lift a lot of weight your first time out. It doesn't mean you don't have muscles and it doesn't mean that your muscles don't work. It means that the level of weight you can lift is at a certain level, especially if it's like if it's your first time in the gym ever or you haven't been in a while. But what happens if you keep going? If you keep going and you keep lifting, what happens? You get stronger. You get stronger. You get stronger. So let me help you understand that when you are building up your faith for miracles, you have to do just that. You have to build it up. You have to build it up. You have to build it up. So the Holy Spirit wants the people of God to know, start building your faith for miracles as I've described to you today with those four principles. And if it doesn't happen right away the first time, like it does in the Bible, the thing to do is not give up. Don't give up. Remember that you're in a gym. Instead of being in a physical gym, you are in a spiritual gym. And you must build your faith to the point where you can, you can get in that groove like Elijah, where you can just say, I'm going to shut the heavens up. And it happens. Where you can do like the woman with the issue of blood, where if I just touch him, I'm going to be whole. And it happens. Where you can, like Jesus, tell him to roll the stone away because somebody coming out that grave. And it happens. Because Peter didn't hesitate. Peter didn't pray. And Peter didn't say if. He just said, I got healing in me. And in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And then Peter pulled him up. If you're not there yet, you have to keep applying the four principles. Uh, don't be in a land of if, no. 
declare it, put some works behind your faith, and be willing to look crazy, keep doing that, and watch what happens. How do I know that? Because I've done it. I've done it. I've done it with physical healing. There's someone that uh, I laid hands on and I told them they were going to get healed of asthma. And they did. Like that. There was a time where I needed a door open in my life. And the Lord told me to say it. And I said it. And that door opened and it was a miracle. Because it was a situation I had been fighting for a very long time. And in the natural, it didn't look like there was going to be a breakthrough. And the Lord told me what I just told you. Say it. And I said it, and that door did that right there. And I'm standing there. I had to blink a few times because I was like, whoa. But it happened. Okay? And I personally have been healed of angina. Do you know what angina is? Angina is when your blood vessels constrict. And they can just close and shut down and shut your circulatory system and your heart down. And I had angina when I was... 24, 25 years old. And I went to one of my mentors, the prophet. And I went to the doctor first and the doctor gave me a prescription. And then I went to my friend, mentor friend, the prophet. And I was all worried and scared. And then he prayed and the anointing fell. And he said, the power of God is on me to heal you. And he's put his hands on me and he said I was healed. And I didn't feel nothing. So I left his house and I was on my way to the pharmacy to get my medicine. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you don't have to get that medicine. I said, Lord, the doctor said, my blood vessel is about to close up. He said, you don't have to get that medicine. And I said, then what do I have to do? He said, just believe. So I said it, and I believed, and I felt the power of God shoot out through my heart and open my blood vessels up. And you see, I'm still here. This was when I was 24, 25, which was a while ago. And you see, I'm still here. Because ain't John, ain't no joke. So that's what I mean when I tell you I always tell you every week, there's nothing that I'm saying and doing and preaching and teaching to you that I'm not doing or I haven't done. I have been there. Okay? So it's our job, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit now, to start practicing these principles so we can walk in this level of faith for miracles. And I want to repeat, if it doesn't happen right away the first time, do not give up. You are building your faith muscles in the spirit the same way you build your natural muscles by using uh, weights in the gym. You understand that? Now that's one thing sometimes uh, with the Bible. The Bible sometimes compresses a lot of time like in a verse. <laughs> like the Bible would compress like 20 years in one verse and say stuff like, and it came to pass. <laughs> and that verse, it came to pass, it's like 20 years. And so... I'm saying that to say that Elijah had obviously spent time with God building up his faith and he comes on the scene at that level. Jesus the Christ, when God became a man, he gave himself 30 years before he went public. The Lord gave himself 30 years to grow before he started his public ministry. Peter and John had walked and talked with Jesus for three, three and a half years. They saw him get arrested. They saw him get beaten. They saw him get spit upon. They saw him get crucified. They saw him get put in the ground. And then they went to his tomb and they saw that it was empty. And then they saw him appear. And then they saw him for 40 more days. And then they went to uh, Pentecost and the Holy Ghost fell. And they knew that they were walking in the same power Jesus was walking in because the Lord promised he was going to empower them with the same power he had. And Peter knew he had it. But that was after three years. Because remember that when Jesus got arrested, Peter denied that he knew him and ran away. So it took Peter a while to get what Jesus was trying to get him to get. That's my point. So if it's true for them, it's true for us. So that's what I mean when I say, if it doesn't happen the first time, like it does here in the Bible, don't be discouraged and don't let that make you lose heart or lose faith. And don't let the devil or wicked people convince you that it's not working. What you are actually doing is building up those faith muscles. So if you can deadlift, let's say you can deadlift 200 pounds, okay? The first time you tried to deadlift, I guarantee you weren't deadlifting no 200 pounds the first time you did it. Let's say you can squat 200 pounds. The first time you squatted, I guarantee you did not squat no 200 pounds the first time you did it. But what did you do? You didn't give up. You started with the weight you could handle. And you kept squatting, kept squatting, and then you built up. It works exactly like that. That's how it works. And so many times, that's the part that's not explained 
Like when you hear stuff in church, because that used to frustrate me when I was a child, because they would tell me what, but they wouldn't tell me how. <laughs> so I kind of made a promise inside myself that if God ever called me into ministry, I wouldn't just tell people what, I'd tell them how. Because that frustrated me big time when I was a teenager. Because I would hear all these platitudes and all these principles and all this stuff from the pulpit. And I'd be like, that's great. But how? And it's like they didn't say how. So that's why I always make a point of telling people how. So that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. You must build it up the same way you build up muscles, the same way you go to the gym. So don't let the devil snatch this word from you. And don't let people laugh at you or mock at you or, or scorn you. I'll give you another example. When I first started prophesying at a different level, because uh, when you are walking the office of a prophet, you are that before you're born. When God shapes you in your mother's womb, he makes you a prophet then. And when God calls you, he's just speaking to what he already put inside of you. But you have to get it and you have to accept it. So when I first started prophesying at a different level several years back, when it first started happening, I was really nervous, and I, I told uh, one of my best friends, I, you know, I don't know if I should do all this, and this is a different level, and and it was a little bit awkward at first when I first did it, but I kept on doing it. I kept on doing it, and then I got more confident, and now I flow in it. That's what I'm saying. It's not that God hadn't already released it to me all them years back, because He did. But I had to build up my faith and my confidence and my, my uh, experience in it. You see what I mean? So that's what I mean, because I flow in it now, but it wasn't that way when I first got to that new level. So that's why I'm trying to encourage you that if it doesn't happen, if the miracle doesn't come like right away, if it doesn't just happen like it does in the scripture, do not give up. Keep using the four principles, which is get out of the land of if. Don't be just talking about if it's God, God's will. You got to know. You got to say it. Okay, you got to put some works behind your faith. You can't just say it. You have to do the things that are in line with you believing that that thing is going to happen. And number four, you got to be willing to look crazy. Let me give you a practical example, and then I'll be done. Let's say you are well past college age, and it's been in your heart for a very long time to go back to school. And let's say you got a word from the Lord, or you got a knowing in your spirit that, you know what? I'm going to get that degree. And let's say you are well past college age. Let's say you're in your 40s or your 50s. And you say, I'm going to get that degree. I guarantee you what will happen is that at some point, somebody is going to come up to you and say, what in the world are you going back to school for at your age? Don't you know that? Okay? Don't let them talk you out of it. If you know that you're supposed to go back to school and get that degree, and that's a desire of your heart, and you know that God has released that to you, then apply it in principles. Don't be talking about if. Say, I'm going to get this bachelor's. I'm going to finish this bachelor's. I'm going to get this associate's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this master's because you know, not if. Not if it be that I will. Because I know I'm supposed to have this degree. You got to say it. Okay? And then you have to apply at the college. Apply at the school. Don't be talking about, oh, Lord, I'm 40, I'm 50. What they going to say? Apply. Put some works behind your faith. And be willing to look crazy. You might be in a classroom with 18 year olds. You ever think about that? You ever think what it would be like to be 40 or 42 or 45 or 50 and you in class with a bunch of people that just got out of high school? They're going to laugh at you and call you old every day. What's that old man doing in this class? What's that old woman doing up in here? You had your chance. I don't know why you're trying to go back to school. You ain't young, you're not relevant. They're going to call you old and laugh at you every day. And my response to that is, so, let them laugh. But don't let it break your faith. Because principle number four is you got to be willing to look crazy. And on the outside, a 40-year-old going to finish that degree with a bunch of 18-year-olds, people are going to talk about you like a dog. So, be willing to look crazy because I bet you if you keep on and I bet you if you believe and if you do the work and you be diligent, you're going to walk across that stage. The day's going to come when you're going to turn that tassel and they're going to say, I now confer upon you the degree of, they're going to hand you the diploma, shake the hand, take the picture, and you're going to graduate at 52, 55, 68, whatever. But you got to be willing to look crazy, principle number four. 
All right? So, praise God. I'm edified by this. I'm applying this in my life. There's some miracles I'm believing for, and I praise God. I praise the Holy Spirit for revealing these principles because I'm applying them. I'm using them just like I'm telling you. So, uh, we're at that portion of the broadcast. Um, if you uh, have a prayer request, put it on the screen right now. If there's something you want me to pray for, put it up there right now, and I'll pray for it. Now, if, if you put it up there and I don't pray for it, it's just because I don't see it. I can't see everything that's rolling across the screen on, on uh, both the platforms. So I'll put it up there, and if I don't see it during the live broadcast, then I'll pray for it after I sign off. But put it up there if you've got a prayer request. Oh, hey there. Nice to see you. Uh, is that Brooklyn native? Uh, first time, but God bless you. Good to see you. So um, if you've got a prayer request, put it on the screen right now, and I'll pray for it. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, so I'm not seeing anything right now. So I'm going to move on to the next part. But if you have a prayer request, please put it up there. Okay. And if I don't pray for it now, I pray for it when I get through. The next part is when you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, uh, I am asking the Holy Spirit for physical healing. If there's someone, okay, Brooklyn saying pray for my relationship. Okay. Specifically, what do you want? Uh, when you say uh, they're Brooklyn native, pray for your relationship specifically. What do you want? Do you want healing? Do you want reconciliation? Do you want better communication? Do you want, you know, do you want to get married? Do you want to, you know, reconnect with someone? So tell me specifically what you want prayer for, for that relationship. So when you see me pray in tongues, then I'm asking the Holy Spirit for physical healing. I'm asking the Holy Spirit for financial revelation. I'm asking the Holy Spirit, are there any demons we need to be cast out? Because you need deliverance. Sometimes you need, okay, you and your mate, okay? Sometimes you need stuff broke off of you. And then I'm also asking the Holy Spirit, is there any prophetic word he wants me to release to close the broadcast, okay? All right, right now, God, I'm praying for Brooklyn uh, Native of God for their mate, that you would bring reconciliation in that relationship, that you would bring healing, that you would put them on one accord, oh God, because there is a unity in the Spirit, that you would give them the unity of the Spirit that only comes from the Holy Ghost, that you would teach them, O oh God, how to take up their cross and crucify their flesh and crucify their self-will and get up every day and say, not my will, but thine be done. And be willing to obey your word and your leading in that relationship that you might be, bring health, healing, prosperity, love, and fellowship in that relationship. And I thank you for it. I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what that means, Brooklyn Native, is that prayer I just prayed, that means that anointing is released unto you. And now you have an anointing now for healing, reconciliation, communication, and love in that relationship. First time, oh, hey, how you doing? So uh, Lisa, is that Lisa I'm seeing? First time, hey, God bless you. So that means that anointing has been released to you now. So now you have to do what I said, Brooklyn Native. You got to believe it. You got to say it. And you have to act like God is going to show up. And you got to be willing to look crazy until the miracle manifests. Okay? God bless you, Lisa. Okay? All right. Amen. Amen. Uh, anybody else with a prayer request? Okay. Uh, Sally, pray for now. Is it what kind of counseling the Lord wants me to go to? All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Sally right now, God, that if you've called her to go to counseling, that you would show her what kind of counseling to go to, to receive. Oh, God, what kind of counseling is ordained for her by you. And also, oh, God, when she pays it forward, when she begins to counsel and work with others, that you would show her what she's supposed to release both through the academic study of the psychological and through the prophetic study of what you have to say to right our minds and right our souls. So help my sister Sally, oh God, to both receive the counseling you have for her and to give the counseling that you're going to use her to release to others. And I thank you for it, and it's done right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Sally, that means that anointing is released to you, so God is going to show you. Um, prayer for financial release. Release her, okay. So God is going to show you, uh, Sally, uh, which counseling to receive and where you should go and who, who you should talk to. But you're going to have a chance to pray it forward. Okay, uh, pay it forward. Uh, so Felisa, uh, you said pray for financial release. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Thank you, God, knowing that your word says that you want us to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. So right now, oh God, I ask for prosperity in the soul of Lisa, oh God, that you would show her in the soulish area where you wanted to prosper in her thoughts, in her emotions, and in her choices. 
and then bring her prosperity, O oh God, so that the money she's looking for will be released as she prospers mentally, emotionally, and in her choices. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name we declare it, and it's so. Amen. All right, so that means that anointing is being released unto you. So now what the Holy Spirit is going to do is going to show you areas of your soul and your thinking and your emotions and in your choices, your will, where you need healing, where you need health, where you need prosperity, where you need to grow so you can come into the financial level that you want to be in. Many times what we don't understand about money is that we've got to be Amen. God bless you. Uh, amen. 401 in prayer. God bless you. We've got to be where we need to be in here for the finances to manifest. Because if you are not ready for a level of finances, that money can destroy you. you got to ask God to show me. God, show me my thinking. For example, if God wants to give you $3 million and you think like $30,000, you're going to take that $3 million and bring it down to the $30,000. You're not going to take that three million and multiply it and make it more because you don't know how to think that way. So God has got to show you how to think on the level. Amen. God bless Brooklyn Native. Thank you for following me. God's got to show you how to think on the level of the money he's trying to release to you so you can get your thoughts up there because you can't be thinking like a $30,000 person. Nothing wrong with making $30,000. I'm not trying to sell anybody. You can't be thinking like a $30,000 person if you're trying to get to a $3 million level. You got to think differently. You have to manage your money differently if you want millions of dollars. It's a whole different thing. Taxes are different. Um, you know, investments can be different. Opportunities are different. And also, new level, new devil. And what I mean by that is whenever God lifts you up to a new level, there's going to be some demons on that level that you haven't fought before. Now, you can win, but there's going to be some new fights. Okay? So, so you got to ask for the prosperity in the soul because that's, that's what the scriptures say. I got to prosper, excuse me, I got to prosper in here first. I got to think like the level I'm trying to get on. I got to feel like the level I'm trying to be on. And I have to choose like the level I'm trying to be on. Because if you can't manage $30,000, you are not going to be able to manage $3 million. If you're wasting your money now and you got $30,000, $3 million is not going to help you. You're going to be in more debt before it's over because you don't know what to do with the money you already have. You understand? So... That's why the scripture said, prosper as your soul prospers. Does that make sense? All right, amen. Any more prayer requests, put them on the screen. I'll pray for them right now. Okay. All right, I'm going to close my eyes and speak in tongues for a few moments and listen to the Holy Ghost about uh, physical healing, deliverance from demons, more financial words, and if there's a final prophetic word. Okay, Holy Ghost is showing me somebody with your left eye and up into your brain. So I actually saw from the eye area up into the brain area, you need healing. Okay, take your hands and put them on both areas. Put your left hand on your eye, put your right hand over on your brain. And say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command my eye and my brain to be fully healed. I command my blood to 